For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the sm least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Caroline, for, for reading the passage um, from today. Before we start, let's pray. Father God, thank you that you're here with us this evening. And I pray that as we look at your word, we would hear from you and we'd be challenged and encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you a rule keeper or a rule breaker? Rule keepers are generally considered to be lovers of structure, details, and resistant to change. Whereas rule breakers are generally considered to be creative thinkers, they have good problem-solving skills, and embrace chaos. Who thinks they're a rule keeper? I love the rules. <laughs> and who thinks they're a rule breaker? Nice. Cool. So we've got a mixture. Well, I think there's a bit of a misconception, and many people think that Christians are rule keepers. Christians follow the rules so they can get into heaven. Church is for those who are good at following the rules, and those who are bad at following them are shunned. But what does Jesus have to say about following the rules? Our passage for today is part of the Sermon on the Mount, a collection of teachings given by Jesus on a hillside near Capernaum. And in this section, Jesus is talking about the scriptures. In verse 17, he says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. People listening to Jesus would have understood the term, the law and the prophets, as the Hebrew scriptures, which is what we would understand today as the Old Testament. The Old Testament can be pretty difficult. It's full of a lot of weird practices and rules that seem a bit strange and irrelevant to us today. And I've always known that the Old Testament is important, but I often kind of skirt over it, having a vague idea of what it's about, but I generally kind of stick to a psalm or something a bit easier when I read the Bible. In the next verse, Jesus goes on to say that not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So I find myself thinking, if Jesus says that not the smallest letter from the law will disappear, then is the Old Testament relevant to me today? Some of the things we read in the Old Testament sit quite well with us and make total sense. Laws like, do not murder or do not steal. Both easy to see why they're important. But there are other things like, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. This one is a little bit more difficult. Do I ditch my stretchy gym pants in favor of something more biblical? And many people often dismiss Christians as inconsistent because they seemingly pick and choose which parts of the Bible they want to follow. How can you claim to base your life on the teachings of the Bible but still be happy to embrace the benefits of lycra-enhanced activewear? And I can just totally see why that is so confusing. And whenever I'm confronted with an argument like this, I sort of just mutter something about Jesus and then quickly move on. 
So what is going on here? Are we just completely ignoring all these things God is telling us to do? And does the Old Testament just not apply to us today? Many of these laws and commands in the Old Testament were given by God to his people, the Israelites, so that they could draw close to him and be set apart as his people. God is entirely holy and perfectly pure. But, just like us, the Israelites were sinful and they messed up and got things wrong. They were unclean and they were not worthy to be in God's presence. It was like they were trying to walk all over God's new cream carpet in their muddy boots. But God provided a set of laws called the ceremonial laws so that the Israelites could purify and cleanse themselves before coming into his presence to worship him. The Israelites could only eat certain foods, wear certain clothes, and they had to sacrifice animals and sprinkle their blood on the altar so that their sins could be forgiven, which all seems rather strange to us today. God is full of the holiest majesty, glory, and splendor. And without these cleansing rituals, people would be separate from God forever. But God cannot bear to be separated from us. He has an overwhelmingly deep desire to be with his people, and not just the Israelites, but all people. God sent his own son, Jesus, to earth to live a completely perfect life, obeying all these commands. Jesus then died a brutal death on the cross, shedding his own blood, the complete sacrifice for sin and the ultimate fulfillment of the law. If we trust in Jesus, we are made righteous. Now, righteousness is one of those words that's kind of flung about a little bit in Christianity. And it's a word I used to squirm at because it felt a bit unclear and inaccessible. But a definition that has really helped me is being right with God. Because of Jesus, we are made right with God. Because of Jesus... We can come into God's presence just as we are, and we don't need to sacrifice animals anymore or worry about the composition of our clothing. For Christians living in 2022, we can take for granted that we can simply come into the presence of God, to sit with him, to listen to him, to worship him. And following all these precise laws and rituals isn't part of our daily lives anymore. But imagine having to do all that stuff. As if it's not hard enough already to get out of the door on a Sunday. Jesus' fulfillment of the law reminds us of how wonderful it is that we can come and be in God's presence. I know I so often forget this, and when I pray, I regularly launch straight into my shopping list, using God as my personal ATM. But how different would my perspective be if I just took a moment to think about how incredible it is that I can even come into the presence of such a holy God? And not just be in his presence, but have a living relationship with him, where God is involved in every aspect of my life. My decisions, my anxieties, my joys, relationships, frustrations, and hopes. And I think we can so easily forget this, especially if we've been a Christian for a long time. So let's not ever take this for granted. What a thing to be cherished. And thank you, Jesus. 
So we know that through his sacrificial death, Jesus fulfilled the law. This seems nice and tidy, right? Because of Jesus, the law can be done away with and we can ignore the entire Old Testament. Well, it's not, that's not quite right. 10% of what Jesus says in the New Testament is directly quoted from the Old Testament. So it must have significance and relevance. So how should we approach the Old Testament scriptures in light of what Jesus has done? When we read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus, it helps us to understand the heart of God and what he is like. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were a group of people called the Pharisees, and they were the ultimate rule keepers. And they were really smug about the way they upheld all the rules and looked down on the people who didn't. However, Jesus really challenges their behavior. He tries to bring people back to the heart of the scriptures. Verse 20 of our passage today says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This seems a little bit of a confusing thing for Jesus to say. How can you be more righteous than the Pharisees? The Pharisees thought they were right with God because they were obeying all the Old Testament rules. But I think one of the things that Jesus is trying to get at here is that we need a different kind of righteousness, one that comes from the heart and not an outward obedience. God is interested in the intentions and desires of your heart rather than how many stars you have on your moral star chart. Jesus goes into this further in the following verses, 21 and 22, when he's teaching about murder. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, even if you're angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. For Jesus, it goes way beyond the external fulfillment of the rules. We can see another example further on in Matthew, in Matthew 12, where Jesus encounters a man whose hand is withered. The Pharisees try to catch him out and challenge him about whether it's right to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus says to the Pharisees, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored, just like the other one. Then the Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. Jesus is full of so much compassion and love for those around him, yet the Pharisees are still making it all about the rules and also about themselves. We can so easily miss the point when we're blinded by the rules and don't get down to the heart of why they're there in the first place. It's so easy to fall into the trap of trying to win God's approval by following the rules. And sometimes, we just enjoy basking in the nice, warm, holy glow that comes with external achievement. But in reality, our hearts are elsewhere. And for us today, perhaps there are rules that we think we're great at keeping. But deep down, maybe our hearts are somewhere else. Getting down to the heart of God's commands helps us to grow in our relationship with him. 
It enables us to get to know him better and to understand the core of who he is. His commands also help us to deepen our understanding of how we relate to each other as well. We need guidelines and we need a framework. Without them, I'm certain we'll just do our own thing. We see that time and time again throughout the Old Testament and in our own lives that human hearts are not equipped to love God and love others fully. Humans mess up time and time again. Even if we think we're pretty good people, we go to church, we do our daily quiet time, we serve on a couple of teams, The reality is, our natural inclination as fallen human beings is to think about ourselves constantly. The ever-popular mantra, you do you, confirms this. Do whatever is best for you. Focus on you. March to your own beat. But when we're all individually marching to our own beat, it does get a bit confusing. What feels good for me might actually have awful consequences on the people around me. God wants our relationship with him to function well. And actually, it's beyond just functioning well. He wants our relationship with him to flourish. God has lovingly created a framework for us so our relationship with him can deepen and bloom into all the fullness of everything he's designed it to be. And this is the same for our relationships with the people around us, our friends, our family, our neighbours. God wants them to thrive. And by flourish and thrive, this doesn't necessarily mean comfortable and easy. Flourishing with God doesn't mean a guaranteed Lamborghini, an Instagrammable kitchen, or relationships with no struggles. Chris spoke about this in his talk on the Beatitudes a couple of weeks ago. Flourishing is the ability to forgive because we're forgiven. Being peacemakers in a fractured world, caring for the poor, knowing peace in the storm, the assurance of being a child of God. Pretty different to what society might tell us about flourishing. My eight-year-old nephew, Cohen, loves football. He lives and breathes it. His mind is always on it. Imagine if one day Cristiano Ronaldo decides to get in touch with Cohen and says, hey Cohen, I want to coach you and help you develop your football skills for free. Be at the football pitch at 9 a.m. with clean boots, make sure you've had a good breakfast and plenty of sleep the night before. What an absolute winner. Such an amazing gift. Now, Ronaldo has put those parameters in place for Cohen because he knows that Cohen will thrive and develop within them. It would be crazy if Cohen turned up late, all disheveled and starving hungry for his coaching session with Ronaldo. Surely, he would do everything he could to please him. It's a little bit like that with God. God gives us parameters because he knows we will thrive within them. If we understand God and who he is, that he loves us and wants the best for us, then surely we would turn up to the football pitch with the right boots on, so to speak. And not out of duty, but out of love. However, the good news is that God is way way better than Cristiano Ronaldo. (laughs) Because God is infinitely patient and full of unending grace when we get it wrong. God knows all of our sins and he still loves us. 
He won't turn us away from the football pitch if we turn up in the wrong boots. If you take one thing away from this talk, then let it be this, that God's acceptance of us is not tied up in whether we can uphold the rules. It's not tied up in our performance. Yes, God has given us a beautiful framework to help us, but we'll never be able to fulfill it all. Following the rules and doing good things will never save us or make us right with God. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus lived a perfect life. The Pharisees thought their righteousness would make them right with God. But Jesus says, it is me who makes you right with God. I am the righteousness. I have fulfilled it all. Jesus says in John 5.39, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures point to me. We are constantly bombarded by follow the rules, follow the rules, try harder, try harder, all the time. Even if it's disguised as something really holistic. I recently saw this pop up on my Instagram. Fill your cup with, listen to an uplifting podcast, journal your thoughts and feelings, Indulge in self-care activities once every week. Watch some funny videos. Dance around once in a while. Do something creative. Mindfully watch the rain or the sunset or just the trees. A random act of kindness. It looks really nice, doesn't it? It looks really cozy and wholesome. But the more you dig into it, the more stressful it actually is. Because there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to feel good. And it's essentially more rule following. It's exhausting and it leaves me thinking, great, more stuff I'm not doing. Now don't get me wrong, these things aren't bad things. It's great to journal and listen to podcasts. But when they become the things that fuel us and fill us without God, then we burn out. Instead of filling our cup with all this stuff that we have to do, let's first fill our cup with Jesus and his spirit. Going back to the Ronaldo analogy, Ronaldo coaches from the sidelines but God coaches from within us. He fills us up with his spirit, and the Bible tells us that he lives inside of us. He is with us and helping us all the time. If our cup is continually being filled with Jesus, then we can go out onto the football pitch fully prepared. Let's ask to be filled with more of him every single day so that we might truly know his presence, his power, and his grace. Before we finish, I'd like us to zoom out and think of the Bible as a whole. We have a story, a love story, and a rescue plan between God and humanity with a golden thread weaved all the way through. And the golden thread is Jesus. The Bible is a rich tapestry full of epic stories and detailed intricacies about God's plan, all pointing to Jesus. The message translation of our passage today says, don't suppose for a minute that I've come to, de to demolish the scriptures either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I am going to put it all together, pull it all together in a vast panorama. 
Some of you, especially those of you with young children, may be familiar with the Jesus Storybook Bible and its tagline, Every Story Whispers His Name. The first chapter beautifully summarizes what I've been sharing with you today. It's called The Story and the Song, and it goes like this. Some people think the Bible is a book of rules, telling you what you should and shouldn't do. The Bible certainly does have some rules in it. They show you how life works best. But the Bible isn't mainly about you and what you should be doing. It's about God and what he has done. Other people think that the Bible is a book of heroes, showing you people you should copy. The Bible does have some heroes in it. But, as you'll soon find out, most of the people in the Bible aren't heroes at all. They make some big mistakes, sometimes on purpose. They get afraid and run away. At times, they are downright mean. No, the Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the one he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story is, it's true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story. And at the center of the story, there is a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He is like the missing piece in a puzzle. The piece that makes all the other pieces fit together. And suddenly, you can see a beautiful picture. So, let's delve deep into the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, so we can discover for ourselves this remarkable story. From the beginning to the end, it is and always will be about Jesus. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, for the Bible and the incredible story that it tells. Thank you that Jesus is at the center of this story. Thank you that it is true, this story is true, and that it brings us so much hope. And I pray that over the coming weeks, months, and years, we would have a deep love for getting to know you through your word. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit today so that we might do things in your power and not not in our own strength and in our own rule keeping. Fill us afresh so that we might know you more. In Jesus' name, amen.